President number 31, Herbert Hoover, a remarkable man who just happened to become president at a bad time. He was born in 1874 in Iowa. His family were Quakers. He had a brother and sister. Now, uh, his father died when he was about six years old. His mother grieved and poured herself into her religion, left the boys and their sister with relatives so she could travel and preach. But then she got sick and died when he was nine years old. The kids went to live with a guardian, then a grandmother, and then an uncle. Hoover went to Stanford University to study geology. Geology, the study of rocks. How exciting. In Stanford University, the only female majoring in geology was a girl named Lou Henry. Well, Hoover and her hit it off. They got together, they got married eventually, and she was Episcopalian, but she became a Quaker so they could marry. Eventually, they had two boys. After graduation, Hoover went to Australia, and it was in very dreary conditions that he worked. Uh, but he started to make a lot of money in mining. He and Lou also worked in China, where they both learned Mandarin. Then he opened the Zinc Corporation. Now, the Zinc Corporation would buy tailings. What are tailings? Well, there's silver and lead metals, and they also sometimes carried zinc. But you couldn't extract the zinc, so they would leave those tailings behind. Hoover and his corporation developed a system that could extract the zinc and bingo! The corporation was supplying the world with zinc and other metals. Becoming an independent mining consultant, Hoover became very rich, acquiring $4 million by the time he was 40. That's equivalent of $94 million today. When World War I broke out, he got involved in helping get Americans out of Europe. This meant getting cash, transportation tickets, and with the help of 500 volunteers, he helped get 120,000 Americans out of Europe. Then he helped getting food and transporting it over to German-occupied Belgium. This became his baby, working 14 hours a day for two years. Eventually, they were feeding 9 million starving war victims every day. When the United States joined the war, he became head of the U.S. Food Administration. After the war, there was a severe famine in Soviet Union. Six million had died, and Hoover, in spite of the anti-Soviet feeling and despite the Cold War, he got involved. He said there were 20 million starving and he would get them food. Well, he and his organization helped save millions from starvation. Some considered him one of the greatest Americans of the 20th century, and he was picked to be Secretary of Commerce under Warren Harding and Calvin Coolidge, getting his fingers involved in pretty much everything. In 1927, when the flood occurred in Mississippi and broke the levees, he ran the operations to get people helped. He was asked to help by six governors. He ran the local and state militia, the Red Cross, engineers, the Coast Guard, health units to stop diseases. It was a stupendous achievement of organization. Well, with this national recognition, Hoover, who had never run for any political office, now sought the first elective office he would acquire, and it was for the President of the United States, and he won. He promised the people a chicken in every pot and a car in every garage. But little did he know, the United States would soon enter the worst economic period in all its history, the Great Depression. At first, things were promising. He believed in limiting regulations and volunteerism. He canceled oil leases to big companies. He got the Justice Department and the IRS to work together to lock up gangsters like Al Capone by chasing them for tax evasion. He also closed a lot of tax loopholes for the rich. He advocated, but failed, to reduce taxes for lower income families, and he held conferences for the betterment of children, regardless of race, nationality, or religion. He set aside five and a half million acres of national parks and forests. But then came the stock market crash of 1929, the so-called beginning of the Great Depression, 
This is really not true since less than 3% of Americans owned stocks. Is anyone to blame for the Great Depression? What caused it? Well, experts still debate this, and I'm not an expert, but I'll do my best. You see, during World War I, more food was needed for the soldiers in Europe. Farmers began developing machines to help improve food productivity. After the war, this brought too much productivity and the oversupply brought food prices down, endangering the livelihood of the farmers. Many of them lost their farms and moved to the cities. Also, to make matters worse, there was a drought and the Midwest became what they called a dust bowl. Also with World War I came more industry, which brought washers and dryers that became more available with payment plans, loans, and installments. What a concept! Buy now, pay later. Houses and cars were also more attainable, and more and more people moved away from the rural areas and towards the urban areas. Now, Coolidge and Hoover had brought down regulations, so acquisitions were easier to get, businesses were booming, but along with deregulation comes speculation. Hoover once said that the only thing wrong with capitalism were the capitalists. People were just too greedy. Sales, realty companies, bank loan officers would often push shady deals on unsuspecting citizens. To make things worse, this was a new era. Nobody understood the new 20th century. These quick changes and innovations, very different from today. Banks used to lend a lot of money for businesses to open, but now they were lending more money to buy a house or to buy stocks. You were borrowing money to buy stocks and hope they would go up. Now, some millionaires like this Joseph Kennedy, John F. Kennedy's father, played it safe. He sold his stocks before the crash. Okay, so deregulations, farm failures, overextension of credit, and the crash. Then, banks were not lending money. So businesses couldn't sell, so they lowered the prices, which means less profit, which means they fire employees, which means unemployment, which means nobody can buy these products, which means that businesses close, which means you can't pay your mortgage, which means you lose your home. But probably the biggest cause of the depression was the panic when people felt that their money was not secure in the banks. They all went to the banks to withdraw their funds. Banks couldn't accommodate everyone, so they called everyone who owed them money to collect. And when that didn't work, they closed down. Thousands upon thousands of banks closed across the country. Now, this didn't happen overnight. And at the beginning, Hoover did believe that government intervention undermined individuality and self-reliance. People thought he was a bit hands-off, but today the consensus is that he was more active than people thought, especially when advisors were telling him to do even less. He did open many public work programs, which included government spending and subsidies, in particular the Boulder Dam, to later be called the Hoover Dam. He formed the Federal Farm Board to lend farmers money, he regulated labor laws, and opened a banking system similar to, today, to today's Federal Reserve. But he was so intent on balancing the budget that he turned down programs for welfare. He also decided to raise tariffs on foreign goods, which encouraged Americans to buy American. Unfortunately, Europe and Asia did the, the same thing, and they raised tariffs on the United States. By 1932, one out of every four American workers was unemployed. People were pulling their children out of school so they could work. 5,000 banks had closed. The remaining businesses had defaulted on their loans. Hundreds of thousands of people were homeless, and everybody blamed Hoover. This created a new vocabulary. People would build shacks out of wood and cardboard, and they called them Hoover Hotels. A neighborhood of Hoover Hotels was called a Hooverville. The newspaper you used to wrap yourself in at night was your Hoover blanket. Your empty pockets were Hoover flags. A garbage can with fire inside was the Hoover heater. Well, Hoover created more public work programs to create jobs and loans were given to farmers and businesses. To pay for all this, taxes were raised on the rich up to 62%. He also raised corporate tax and he took back the tax cuts he had given to the rich previously. 1932 was election year, and as much as Hoover now hated his job, he ran for re-election. It didn't help that he had this boring monotone when he read his speeches, and when he traveled the country, people followed to yell and throw rotten food at his car or train as they yelled, We want bread. 
To make things worse, the Democratic Party had as their candidate the charismatic Franklin D. Roosevelt. It was a rough road ahead for Hoover to win re-election, but then came the bonus army fiasco, and this ended his career. You see, World War I veterans were promised a bonus which they would get in 1945. Well, desperation set in, and thousands of veterans marched to Washington, D.C. to demand their bonus now. They built shanty towns to live in, marched to the Capitol building, and for days and days they camped out. Hoover sent them food, but when Congress turned them down, they refused to leave. Fights would break out, and finally Hoover decided they had to go. To get the veterans to leave the Capitol, Hoover called on future World War II hero General Douglas MacArthur, who came along with his officers young Dwight Eisenhower and George Patton, future war heroes of their own. They came down and they descended with their troops on the veterans and a riot broke out. Tear gas was used, hundreds of civilians were injured, a child was blinded, and one 11-month-old baby died from the fumes. The veterans pushed back, but MacArthur didn't stop there. He pushed forward with his troops, and against orders, he went and torched the encampment, burned down all the shanty towns where the veterans were staying. Well, the veterans were very dejected. The country was horrified. This happened three months before the election, and of course, this sealed Hoover's fate. Roosevelt won in a landslide. Poor Hoover had to sit in an open car with Franklin D. Roosevelt and ride to Roosevelt's inauguration, hearing the cheers of the crowd for the incoming president. Feeling embittered and underappreciated, Hoover and his wife went home. He spent time fishing and in solitude. At times he volunteered for public service, but nobody called on him. In 1944, his wife Lou died of a sudden heart attack, leaving him a widower. But after World War II, he became friends with President Harry Truman, and he helped aid in occupied Germany, providing 40 tons of food to 3.5 million German children. He helped the U.S. government eliminate waste and become more efficient. He gained new earned respect as he got older. And in his honor, the project he initiated, the Boulder Dam, was now renamed the Hoover Dam. In 1962, he had a tumor removed from his lower intestines. He got more frail, but refused to be hospitalized. In October 20, 1964, he began to bleed internally and passed away, 31 years after leaving the White House and 20 years after the death of his wife. He was 90 years old. Well, that's it for Herbert Hoover. So now, subscribe or give me your comments below. This is Cool Talk.